we are back again. It is Atlanta Discuss. I remain your host and moderator. Some of you call me host, some of you call me moderator. They all work for me. So I say good day, like my Australian friend would say. I just say good day. In the past, I always say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because it's a uh, different time zone in different part of the world. So good day to all the seven continents of the world, Antarctica, Australia, Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, South America. Thank you all for your loyalty. Well, today we are still going back to that country, Nigeria, that has the largest concentration of black people on the planet. There was an election well over 30 years ago, the June 12 election. A lot to say that was the freest and fairest. I don't think there's any Nigerian or anybody in the world that would disagree because that election created a lot of awareness. That election did not see the light of day. We still don't know the result. The winner, of course, the undeclared winner died along the line. There was so many years of military dictatorship under Abacha. And somewhere along the line, after the death of the two principal actors, we had democracy. With the intervention of the whole world at that time, everybody was focal point Nigeria, from the Commonwealth, United Nations, the, the world, you United Nations, the General Assembly, or whatever, whatever body you can call it. Nigeria was under sanction. Nigeria became a pariah nation. But in 1999, we had democracy. Now, today, June 12 is a public holiday in Nigeria. It's called Democracy Day. Now, we just celebrated it just some days ago, but has any lesson been learned? What do we have to show for it? That's why today the topic will be the significance of June 12. It's irrelevant. It's a vital statistic. Have we learned anything? We're going to find out. And you know, in Atlanta Discourse, we bring the best. Erudite scholars, people that true to power, say it the way it is, and they've earned their epaulets by any standard available. That's why today we have Tunji Omotola in the house. Tunji Omotola, welcome to Atlanta Discourse. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you to your listeners and your viewers around the world. Yeah. Thank you. Tuji is not new to us, but you all know Tuji is a man of many parties, pan Africanist. You know, you see him on radio, TV, everywhere. He lives in Joburg. He's a wine connoisseur. He's the MD of Vain Wife. He's also a stockbroker, you know, and he has eight degrees and certificates in wine. You know, it's a major connoisseur. So I respect him for that. But apart from that, he has certificates and degrees in real estate insurance from UK, you know, he has been to business school. And when you want to know about anything to just the man, you all heard him talk here in the past. And this is not going to be the last time you are going to hear him. He's also a Bloomberg Media Certified Financial Analyst. So when Bloomberg says it's good enough, yes, Atlanta discuss, we agree with it. So in our tradition, you know it, we go for the juggler, truth to power, you know, no old bear. He's always in discussion. That's why we like scholars like you. Over 30 years down the line, to just, what are the core significance of that day, June 12th? I know you've written books about it. You've written so much about it. You believe in that election, you know. Does this symbolize anything? You know, because our present democracy is replete with so much errors, a lot of errors. We don't even organize free and fair elections anymore. I doubt if we've had any election that is as good as that one, you know. So, and even by African standard, our elections are very, very abysmal. So what's symbolic about that day? Over to you, today. Okay. Look, first of all, let me say this about Nigeria's democracy, the Fourth Republic. I think we are happy that we're not under military rule, mm. because military rule, if you remember, the first coup, mm. January 15, 1966, mm. that removed mm. Tafar Balewa, our first mm. prime minister. He was assassinated. Okotiebo was assassinated. And we had uh, Maima Lari was assassinated, and even Lajima, Colonel Abo Lajima. So our mm, military Abu Lajima. Mm. and our top politicians were assassinated in the first coup, six years into our democratic experiment. experiment. And not long after not that, long. because of the counter coup in July that took out uh, Aguiye Rossi, if you remember. And Adekule mm -hmm. Faji, who was killed, Agui uh, Rossi was killed in Ibadan, by the way. And because mm -hmm. Adekule Faji said, you can't take him away, you have to take mm -hmm. me along, he was also killed. So within six years of our democracy, a new nation, our democracy was destroyed by the military. So we all know that military, mm -hmm. but in most parts of Africa and the world, the military have not done much for us. But here we are in 1993, 
We had elections that were free and fair. Chief MKO Abiola Moshud Kashimawo Olawale Abiola scored 58% in that election. He was voted for pro up and down the country, and the military decides to annul that election. Now, that was the beginning of Nigeria's problems, political problems, if you like, in recent times. And what then happened, of course, was that the military doubled down because General Labacha then took over from the interim government. He sat the interim government of Chief Choneko. And General Labacha then set out to sponsor killings of Nigerians by the state, state sponsored assassination of his opponents. And that's how people like Professor Shoyinka and even our president today, President Bola Tinubu, ended up in exile. But now, if you look at the, all of this, and you see where we are now, after 31 years of President uh, of, uh, Chief Abiola being declared president, when you look at what's going on in the country with 33% inflation, with the Naira, the Nigerian Naira, that 30 years ago, the Nigerian Naira couldn't have been more than one to four, one dollar to four Naira. Because if you remember, mm -hmm. in fact, probably about 10 Naira, if you remember that it was under President Babangida, the military leader, that we started the Forex thing, the second tier foreign exchange market, right? That started, we started to buy dollars or use dollars to buy Naira. So when you look at where we are today, even 30 years ago when there was a crisis of politics, today is a crisis of economics. Nigerians are running away. There is no semblance of democracy. People are crying about elections, that they're not free and fair. And the president himself, having been in power for over a year, there's still no hope. He's promised hope. And we still don't see that hope. And Nigerians are saying every day, this country has become so difficult. People are hungry. People are crying. So what Abiola died for 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, what Chief Rewani died for, what people like Shewiara Dua died for, it is not, there's no evidence that there was any free and fair election and there was a struggle for democracy 31 years ago by Nigerians. Even though even the current president was part of that struggle, there's no evidence. Nigerians cannot relate that the president fought for that freedom that we're talking about 31 years ago. President Ahmed Bola Tinubu does not signify the democratic struggle of 31 years ago in the same way that people like Nelson Mandela stood as a symbol in South Africa. Well, so with the way things are now, it does look like we've not really learned anything. <laughs> All right, good. Now, the current president, like you said, was part of the June 12th struggle. You know, it's common knowledge. He, I mean, he's a, he's a beneficiary of whatever emanated at that time because one of the reasons why he became a gubernatorial candidate for the last of democracy and subsequently governor of Lagos State was the role he play, played in the June 12 struggle. So now, do you think we should expect anything that will improve democracy, or should we expect him to implement all the cardinal beliefs of the human rights activists and the crusaders of those days? Because part of those things were restructuring, devolution of powers, tampering with the exclusive list and all of that. What do you think should be the expectation of Nigeria now that it's there? Because clearly, the ship of state doesn't look well, you know, captain, you know, I mean, we'll be, we don't have to be diplomatic about that. You said it, the problem is not even political now, it's more of economic than, you know, so he, I'm sure even in his heart of heart, he knows that, well, this is not Lagos, this is Nigeria. So what should we expect from him based on the old ethos and, and, and beliefs of the old guards, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the human rights activists, the evolution of powers or what have you? Over to you. I think the president's... Uh... Dominia, I use the word Dominia because it was in South Africa yesterday. I suspect he's still around or maybe he's left. And I think uh, when you look at his general Dominia, his body language, 
it's not mm -hmm. very inspiring even mm -hmm. for the even for those who are the most optimistic about change in the country but let's look at his record because you can only judge a man by his record mm -hmm. and when you remember that before president bolotinu came to power he said that he was going to renew the hope that hope was coming that there's hope for mm. Nigerians. What's the situation today? Everything that he met there, he has tampered with, and he has not had a fallback. He has not had something to relieve. So he, when he puts the injection in, he does not have any pain reliever. And the, the biggest part that I think is a painful story about mm. President Ahmed Bola Tinubu is that I thought that he would have done a quick assessment and said, look, when he won at the Supreme Court, so many Nigerians were disappointed because they felt that he stole the election. Well, he didn't steal it directly, but that he had some help from the Independent National Election Commission, INEC, who declared the results at 4 a.m., in the morning when Nigerians were fast asleep and knowing that they had not loaded the results from the beavers to the IRF, they carried on anyway. So what I thought President Ahmed Bola Tinubu would have done was firstly to maybe form a government of national unity or at least extend positions to the opposition because so many people were against him emerging as president. Even the, his own former, his, his predecessor did not raise his hand happily. There was no love lost between them because President Buhari didn't fully endorse his candidacy. It's almost like it was a pill that was forced on President Buhari. He didn't really get the support at the outset. It wasn't clear to Nigerians that President Buhari was supporting Bola Ahmed Tinubu. But anyway, putting that aside, if you look at this cabinet, because you don't judge him on the basis of those that he's appointed. Now, in his cabinet, apart from the Minister of Interior, Dr. Olubu Mitunji Ojo, and he doesn't really blow his own trumpet like the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, who is not even a member of the ruling party anyway. So any no. credit should go towards the PDP. If Wike is performing, he's not a member of the ruling party. So we would say Wike counsels out Dr. Olubo Mitsunjojo, one PDP and one APC. But outside of those two gentlemen, there's no one in Bola Tinubu's cabinet that is performing even at 50%. Now, these are the things that should concern the president, but he's not been able to have the political will to sack any of his members, those he has appointed. You would expect that by now, he would have said, look, after a year, you haven't performed. I'm going to have to let you go. But he's politically weak as well. He can't even sack anyone. Since he has appointed thousands of people, but he has not sacked a single individual, despite all the pain and misery of the population and their yearning for change. He has not been sensitive to respond to any of the cries of the people. Wow. So why do you think he has this uninspiring look? Could it be that uh, he, he carries a moral burden of how he was elected? Because I've spoken to people in the past, I think that, well, he's struggling with that moral burden because he knows that he didn't win the election. I mean, the truth is also that one, I think, 37% of the entire vote cast, you understand, which is not pan-Nigeria in any way, shape, or form. So, and you also have the certificate scandal issues, you know. So, these things, I mean, he has not even come out to defend himself on that. So, it's more like whatever is in the grapevine, whatever is out is true especially when there are documents to back up those allegations. So do you think he's suffering a moral burden and that has affected his confidence level? I think he has a lot of back. Firstly, I don't think mm. the president is very physically healthy. If you look at the fact mm. that 70% of Nigeria's population are under 35 years of age, youth population. Mm. 
Our president is not strong physically. On June 12th, there's democracy there. Our president, you know, I mean, had a little accident, but it looked bad. The optics looked very bad. Because oh. who wears Agbada to climb a jeep in this day and age? Agbada to climb a jeep. It's not the wisest uh, fashion uh, choice. He could have worn a suit, trousers and shirts. The weather was nice. But anyway, so I don't think the president is physically healthy. But also, you've got to understand one thing. In the end, the president has not got the right people on his team, in his cabinet. If you remember the cabinet of a gentleman by the name of Good luck, Ebele Jonathan, where we had Dr. Ungozio Kojo Iwiala as the coordinating minister of the economy. We had Dr. Mm -hmm. Akio Miadeshino, who is now the president of the World Bank. And by the way, Dr. Kojo Iwiala is the, is the DG of the World Trade Organization. And they were supported mm -hmm. by even an APC government under President Muhammad Buhari. Now, who are the people that we can say in this current government have the same pedigree as the folks that I just mentioned? So even this current no. cabinet, this current cabinet is full of guys who just, you know, uh, I think the president had to reward them for supporting his very difficult campaign because it was very difficult for the president because he had, for the first time since 1979, or 1983, we had a northern candidate, and we had a southeastern candidate, and a southwestern candidate. So it was a very difficult election, because that's the tripod of Nigeria. The three major tribes fielded a very strong candidate in the election in three different political parties. And then we had Kwan Kwaso from Kano, almost like Aminu Kano, in 1983, if you remember the late Malam Aminu Kano. Yeah. Yes, he used to deliver Kano. So I think the president has missed the boat. I think it's never too late to, you know, to still get on the boat. But for now, I think he's serving the interests of those who helped him to get to power. I don't think he's turned the corner to be now focused on the masses of people who voted for him. Is still working for the political elites and the business elites. So oh, I think that that explains why they've made a lot of very insensitive uh, decisions in the past. Like uh, in one of the supplementary budget they had in the past, they had the budget two point four billion for cars, just for cars for the first lady. They rolled that is purely on constitution. They bought a yacht, and now we are hearing that they want to buy new jets for the presidential fleet. When we have about ten, and you know. I mean, so if the president thinks that he owes allegiance to those that elected him, then we should have very little or no expectation. Is that what you're saying? Look, I think that Nigerians have to be very vigilant, especially mm. those of us who have managed to, I call us the refugees, successful mm. refugees, who we managed to <laughs> escape. Because when you have escaped from Nigeria, like my late father said, Every Nigerian is guilty until proven innocent. So I suspect mm. that every Nigerian who has fled abroad, who is not suffering, is a successful refugee. <laughs> now, what we successful refugees need to do, and I've said this many times, the public officials in Nigeria are fewer than us who have escaped from Nigeria. So if each of us can snatch a, a number or steal a phone number of any public official at any level in Nigeria, we have to send them a stinker and say, listen, we are paying your salary and you are not delivering. We're tired of seeing Nigerians suffering, no jobs, no electricity, no road, no hospital, no security. If you can't deliver, please resign. And we put their picture next to that message and we post it on the internet. We can no longer wait for public officials to do the right thing. If you remember the statement or the quote that politics is too important a business to be left to politicians alone. 
I think Nigeria, maybe because we didn't struggle and suffer like South Africans or die for freedom, we take it for granted. Nigerians are taking this democracy for granted. They don't have the number of their House of Rep member. They don't have the number of their councillor. They don't have the number of their local government chairman. They don't have the number of any commissioner or any minister or senator in Nigeria. And they complain. It means that we are not serious about democracy. Democracy is government of the people, for the people, by the people. And every person has one vote. Whether it's Aliko Dangote or Moshudi the electrician, they all have one vote. In a democracy, Dangote is no more important than Moshudi the electrician. That is the reality that Nigerians must wake up to. No politician in Nigeria is a divine being. We must hold them to account. And how do we start? Send them an SMS, be a nuisance, call them, stop them, be a nuisance. They will appreciate you. But not calling them is not an option. It is our democracy. It is our country. So that is my take. No more waiting for people to perform on the job. They are not magicians. They are human beings. We have mm. to push them. Even when they are sleeping, we wake them. You know, you about they say, eh, oh, soon. That is what they must hear in their dream. Are they hearing the day today today? If they are not hearing the day today today, they will be sleeping. So now, what you've said now is even helping me to navigate what my next question to you will be. You know, you're Pan-African in trade. I've read a lot of things that I've written. I've heard you speak. And by the way, Tuji is the son of the former vice chancellor of the University of Lagos, uh, Professor Jalili Omotola. Those of you that are alumni of that great institution will know. So when you see Tuji speak with precision, you know, and fantastic diction, he has a fantastic heritage. So anyway, so you're Pan-African in trade and character. You're doing a human's job, even for refugees in South Africa, people from Namibia, Zimbabwe. People have told me in person what effort you're making to even coordinate the Nigerian diaspora organization, the different chapters and what have you. Now, recently we saw election in Senegal that was very, very successful. And the, the, the lesson for me in the Senegalese election is that when uh, Diouf was president, you know, he, was, he didn't want to lead. So wait was people driven and when took out the off, you know, based on the people's support. Now, when it also uh, became a, a a pain to the people, you know, and the people rose the defense of Maki, so, and uh, the true went away. Now, Maki himself got carried away by the paraphernalia of office, and lo and behold, Bashiro and Soko too, you know, they thought it after. And, for the first time, even in that country, they didn't need to have a runoff. The people's voices count, and the rest is history. Senegal is on the democratic map. I mean, so things are going smoothly. You know, just recently in where your country of residence, South Africa, there was an election where the ANC, despite their popularity and all that, could not even score 50% of the vote. I mean, between me and you, we know that in Nigeria, <laughs> the ruling party will have done magic here and there, you know. So my question is really that. Will Nigeria ever get there? I mean, because everything you're saying now is that the people, the citizen, and we've done a lot on Atlanta discourse regarding that. The office of the citizen, the people themselves, they are not aware. Poverty has been weaponized, you understand? You know, how can we actually start having this kind of election? How can we recalibrate? Because you also said that tribalism has blinded us to the reality of the day. Oh, is your bias, my brother? Emilio Con, let him, let him enjoy himself. After all, when Buari was there, he was appointing a skipper king there. So if we to get there, we can do any how we want. Now, going through this part, Nigeria will never, I mean, you know and I know that Tinubu has borrowed over 20 trillion already. If we add that to what Buari is, Buari did, we are going over 100 trillion naira in, in debts alone. That's not good, you know. So how do we make the people wake up what kind of awareness do we have or is there do you have a recipe for that actually you do yeah it's it's look I did, let me be honest with you i think that in the short term in the short term you know when they say yeah. if somebody's hungry 
whatever you give them to eat is better than giving them nothing. So basically in Nigeria at the moment, I think that things are going to be harder before they get better mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Nigerians don't appreciate the truth. You know, mm -hmm. somebody doesn't go to work, but they go to church, right? Mm -hmm. You send them a message, they won't go. They will tell you that it's far or there's traffic. I just came back mm -hmm. from Nigeria. I know what I went through. You know, you pay so much money. I'm not even talking about government now. You pay 80000 there to hire a car, and the car stops in the middle of Ikorodu Road, and trailers are coming for you, man, because you have to push the car. And what are mm. you going to do? The driver is so fra frail. He has probably not eaten a good meal in the last few days, but he's your driver. But the company has taken 80000 there from you to hire that car. Now, this is there's a mentality that our people have that they think that the next person must do the hard work, the heavy lifting. You know, so there's a daddy somewhere. There's an Oga that must Don't carry the burden. I think that psychology has to change. But also, for me, I think the biggest opportunity for Nigeria now, today, go and write it down. Write it anywhere, on any street, on any wall, is this diaspora. When you have a large diaspora, you leverage it. There are Nigerians in every genre, in diaspora, global players, mm -hmm. in the UK cabinet, in the US cabinet, in the NBA, in NASA. They're everywhere. They're mayors. They're, they're everything in diaspora. But the government is naive. People think, oh, I'm a minister. I'm this, I'm a senator. The Nigerians in diaspora are far more successful per capita than Nigerians back home because it, at home there's no jobs, there's no water, there's no electricity. So Nigerians in diaspora must wake up to the reality that they're far more powerful than most Nigerians in Nigeria. It's not about how many cars you've got. It's living in a society that allows you to maximize your potential. And when you look at that, when you focus on that for a moment, look at Oprah Winfrey, look at Barack Obama, look at Carl Lewis, look at Marvin Hagler, look at Mike Tyson. These are just a few African-Americans in America, in one country. But Nigerians are like that all over the world. But the government would place them under an ambassador's wing in a specific country, and the ambassador will think is better than all those successful Nigerians in the U.S., in Canada, in Congo, in South Africa. So we have a structure that does not allow even the diaspora to be able to participate in the commanding heights of our economy, to drive it. Let me give you a specific example. The head of the Sovereign Wealth Fund in Nigeria, Sovereign Wealth Fund, you remember yeah. we set up a sovereign wealth fund under Baba. SWS, Baba yeah. Mm -hmm. The head of that sovereign wealth fund is a guy called um, Uche Oji or something. He came from either Goldman Sachs or somewhere. Why didn't they bring someone from Wema back, Wema or FCMB, to head the Nigerian sovereign wealth fund? Because we don't have expertise at that level, right? In terms of financial mm -hmm. services. Look at the old Dangote refinery thing. It's a private business, all right? But the fact of the matter is that what expertise does Dangote have in running refineries before he decided to go and set up a refinery? Are you with me? Was Dangote yes. the MD of uh, Kaduna refinery? Had he ever been in the oil and gas business? No. So now he set up this ginormous refinery but it hasn't changed the fate of any Nigerian since he's set it up. It's almost like, well, it's a startup, even though it's a mm. conglomerate size, mm. but it's a startup. So in Nigeria, we are people who don't understand political economy. And I know that you'd, you live in the United States where they have a system. Washington is different from Wall Street, isn't it? 
Mm. And then you have Main Street. So Wall Street drives the markets and Washington runs government. But the government is also a supplier or uh, an employer of labor. And the government sets taxes and does national security, foreign affairs, but business is allowed to flourish. They flourish. That's why you have big companies like Apple that $3 trillion in market capitalization, which is double the GDP of the entire Africa. But which company in Nigeria is worth even market cap of $10, $20 billion? There's none. So when you look at what we're talking about in terms of Nigeria at the moment is diaspora has to lead. We can't wait. We can't wait for a minister who was a governor in a village in Jigawa to now drive the national consciousness of 200 million people because the man was dealing with a few people in Jigawa, a few people in Nasarawa, even if you're a governor in a boy state for eight years, it doesn't mean that you have the same vision as a person who works in a large corporate in, say, maybe Miami. So the reality is that the cabinet is full of governors and a few senators who don't even understand governance on a global scale, that you can use technology to drive agriculture, you can use technology to drive security, you can use technology to power your economy. They don't understand the imperative of 21st century economics. And that's why there are 50 members in the cabinet and only one or two are working. Wow. Let's talk diaspora. I mean, it's something I'm very interested in, you know, because uh, I, I agree with you that the diaspora contingent only is to the future of Nigeria. Now, uh, there's so many organizations. We have NIDO, we have uh, Nigeria Social Cultural Days. There's so many. So under what auspice, under what guise do you think the Nigerian diaspora contingent can go in and offer solution? Because, I mean, if you know NIDO, little issues there and there, division, they have different factions. But everywhere you see Nigeria, it's not just a NIDO thing. You know, anywhere you see Nigeria, they always, if the problem is not tribal, it's religious, you know, the shape of the nation is not sailing in the same direction, you know. And I sat down with people that think, look, there shouldn't even be in Nigeria. Let the book go, go their way. Let the not be the not and all. But that has not happened. So how do you think the diaspora contingent can offer solution? Should it be individually, collectively, under what auspice, under what guise? We've discussed this a lot in the past. Yes. What do you prefer? It's very simple, Ade. Look, you know, when you're going into battle, you need numbers. It's a numbers game. Mm. Even in Nigeria, if you want to contest in Sulere or Ekboma or in Ido or Bariga or Idishi or Yagoku, you need numbers, right? To be able, you know, even if you want to do a petition online, you want to do a petition, you need you numbers. Need numbers. Mm -hmm. Even if you want to do a protest, you need numbers, right? Even if you want to push a car, you need numbers, right? So, the thing is, for us in diaspora, I've come up with the concept. I mean, you know, I'm the founder of 12 Disciples. You've interviewed mm -hmm. some of our friends. They're not in the same mm -hmm. political party. Mm -hmm. I mean, Collins is in the Green Party. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us are in uh, PDP and so on. Some are in Conservative Party, the Labour Party. People can mm -hmm. even be in the Reform Party, Labour Party. Mm -hmm. It's a multi party democracy. But what I tell people in diaspora is that, look, rather than you belonging to a pressure group, well, it's not a bad idea to belong to NIDO and all of those organizations, but for you to contest for any position in Nigeria, you have to be a member of a political party. You have to be sponsored by a political party. If Barack Obama was not a member of the Democratic Party, you will not be president of USA, same as Donald Trump. So Nigerians who sit in diaspora and say, ah, I don't want to join PDP, I don't want to join Labour, I don't want to join APC, I don't want to join APGA. They're being very naive because you need to be a member of a political party. Siri Ramaphosa is a member of the ANC. So is Nelson, was Nelson Mandela. 
and Tabo Mbeki. Olusegun Obasanjo was PDP and so Huari and uh, Tinubu are APC. If you are in Nido and you are in all this Egbe Omo Yoruba and Oane Zendi, how does that help you when you want to be contest in Nigeria for any office? How many delegates will vote for you at the PDP convention if you are an Oane is a member and you are not a card carry member or you are not a leader in one of the political parties? So my advice is this. Every Nigerian that is in diaspora, whether you are in Australia, you are in Birmingham, you are in Puerto Rico, or you are in Johannesburg, join a political party. We're in a democracy, and it's a numbers game. We can no longer continue to complain. You know, David Mark, Senator David Mark, former Senate president, says that you cannot fight from outside. You have to fight from inside. You see, when Jacob Zuma, he has not left the ANC, and he set mm -hmm. up another machine to reduce mm -hmm. their vote by almost 15%. So wow. let us be active in politics. Politics is not even as dangerous as pe some people that are doing uh, scuba diving and doing uh, bungee jumping, <laughs> bungee mm -hmm. jumping and so on. Politics is about grassroots. It's about building relationships with people and showing an interest in their lives and also putting yourself up there or out there to go and represent them at various levels. In fact, some people never become president. They never become party chairman, but they have a lot of influence because they are members of political parties. And I think the reason why many Nigerians are not members of political parties is because they see politics as very violent and you know that politicians are very corrupt, so they don't want to taint their brand with politics. But you've got to understand one thing. Even in America, where they have the best brands in the world, politics is very important. And they have elections every four years. And even Obama couldn't stay more than eight years. As much as he was photogenic, charismatic, they bring someone else. So they build a system rather than an individual like we do in Africa, where we have 40 years president serving 40 years in office or one party being in power for 40 years. That's not acceptable. Yeah, but I mean, I agree with you 100%, but it does look like our problems are more of institutional decay than, uh, you know, I mean, our, our founding fathers, a lot of them meant well, but we do not have the institution to hold. I'll give you an example. In Africa, you know, a lot of countries have had election recently, like South Africa, where you live, you know, and so the South Africans in diaspora were able to vote. Now, the NIDA we're talking about, that there's supposed to be a diet com board or but something But they like fought that. for it, Mr. Balogo. They fought yeah, for they it fought 2009. For it. They fought for yeah. it in court. So, are, you, are we fighting? When we, in Nigeria, yeah. they say every Nigerian in diaspora should contribute $5 a month for two years. Let's go and fight in court. People will tell you they're not interested. Mm. They fought for it. Okay. Fair enough. So, but we are not fighting for it, right? But so we're fighting we for it, but we're not. We're fighting for it as well. But we don't I have. I was going to say that we don't have a serious campaign going ongoing with money backed with money, and really using all our networks globally to say, look, that's right. Not that's ready. exactly where I'm going. If we yeah. want to fight that fight, I believe it. I believe that fight should be taking place right now. I I don't think it is. You know, I think there's a, a lot of misplaced priorities. I also think that the people that in diaspora that that are also struggling to get government patronage, they don't understand the efficacy or the importance, the strategic importance of uh, of the diaspora contingent. You, you understand? So I think that's also part of the problem. I think we have to name this, and shame them. We yeah. have to name and shame them. Look, well, I get it to you know, you know look, Mr. Balogo, do you know that even the cabinet, we have a list of the members of cabinet. We know is the mm -hmm. Minister of Works. We know two guys in housing, sorry, two guys in mm -hmm. foreign affairs. We know uh, Edu is in uh, finance. We know who's, That's there. Yeah. who's there. We yeah. have in a democracy. And they all come abroad. They all come yes, abroad. <laughs> yes, in a democracy, the power of democracy is that you have free speech, you have uh, equity, you have uh, justice, human rights, 
So what happens in diaspora that I've seen, Mr. Balogu, is this. Nigerians in diaspora are not ready to engage the leadership of Nigeria on good governance, accountability, and transparency. They are more interested in watching the premiership. The Euro championships are on right now. I can bet my bottom dollar that the Nigerian elites, even those in diaspora, are watching Germany and watching Romania, watching Ukraine and Portugal play football at the highest level. And rightly so. But if you were to do a webinar on diaspora voting for us to contribute money or for a candidate who is contesting in Nigeria, they will disappear quietly. We have to name and shame our people. There is no victory without a fight. We must name them. Even Kemi Badenoch, even Wale Adeyemo in the U.S. cabinet, Yes, what are they doing to further democratic gains in Nigeria? They must be called out. There is no yeah. more hiding place for successful Nigerians in diaspora to ignore the pain and misery of millions of our people who are being misgoverned on a daily basis at all levels of government, both judiciary, legislature, and the executive. It cannot be acceptable. We're in 2024, not 1984. Well, well, well. Spoken true to power. Spoken like a patriot always. Well, my my argument in all this still remains that you know we've had one, two, three, four, five, six diaspora and go home, and they think they were even worse than you know people that do missiles in Nigeria. They, I mean, there are some that did well. I mean, everybody's proud of Okonjo, well, the Femi, of this world. Per capita, per capita. Mr. Balogu, per capita, there is no such thing as diaspora and our worst. You have mm. to do the numbers. It's all about numbers. Okay. If one person sneaks in out of 5,000, or let's say mm -hmm. three out of 5,000, mm -hmm. and let's say That's even all. all three, even if all mm -hmm. three were bad, it's still the sample is still negligible. But if Absolutely. we have 100 people go in and 80 people are bad, then we can talk about a sizable sound. Mm -hmm. We are not in the picture. We are not in the picture. Most of the opportunities tend to come from appointments rather than mm -hmm. elections. And we're not so, interested in appointments. If you give me commissioner in Nigeria or minister, I can decline if it's not a portfolio that I can handle. You understand? But if you give me even a, uh, a, a commissioner in a portfolio that I can handle, I'll, I'll go and do the job. So what we're saying is that we have enough brains abroad. There's a gentleman who went to Nigeria recently, and I have to highlight this case. And he went to Nigeria, was trying to relocate to Nigeria. He was in the oil and gas space. We have a CEO in Nigeria who was, you know, not running the company very well, and he was about to sack the CEO. I think they were going to give the CEO the boot. I don't know if you heard about the story. And he was found dead in his hotel two weeks ago. Oh, Young wow. man. Oh, wow. Yes, from oh, the wow. U.S., from Dallas, oh, wow. from Houston. So oh, there wow. are people who make an effort. You know, Nigerians are very patriotic. You know, we are very patriotic people. So mm -hmm. there are people who make the effort. But when they're going home, they have no insurance. They're just there on euphoria. I said, Nigerians and that's where we must stop the euphoria. Don't be emotional about going to Nigeria. There's no value in going to Nigeria if you're going to push a car on Fadei on Western Avenue and you're paid 80,000 naira. And True. you're still pushing the car and trailers are coming for you. Articulators are coming for you. You just die for nothing. Nigeria doesn't have much to offer its own people. Because if they did, there wouldn't be all this protest and anger and frustration. But we outside Nigeria, the buffer, we're the only hope because at least we can speak freely and we can also be able to speak truth to power because in the climes that we live in, there's no warlords and there's no godfatherism. It would never work. 
where we live. There's no God. I have no Godfather in South Africa. And I suspect you have no Godfather where you are. Okay, well, I don't in Nigeria, you. you have to go to <laughs> Bali. <laughs> it's, it's one of Every the problems I've always had, you know. Well, I'm not a really good type. <laughs> <laughs> I have a mind of my own, man. I'm, no, I'm, if I'm, you're I'm in I'm Nigeria, really... you have to go to Bali for one allergy no, somewhere. No, no, no. Before no, you go to Gwen. No, no, no. <laughs> Swear to oath, right? <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. So, now... I like the your line of thoughts. I I love it. I respect it. I'm 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 an advocate of what the diaspora needs to do. And all you know, we've we've discussed a lot in the past, and we are still discussing. But under what guys? They have has, said it has to, to, to be to you, my brother. Listen, if yeah. you want to mm. go to church, you must know whether you are apostolic mm. or whether you are <laughs> or whether you are Pentecostal. You know, you have Marcelo, to have a, yeah. yes. Yeah. I have said it, and I'll say it. Whether you're an Ezendigbo chairman, or you're Egbo Mo Dudua president, or you're president of Nigerian women, or NIDO, or NAVDAC, or NAFTA, or whatever, whatever. GNC, <laughs> or NIN, or BVN, you call yourself, you must belong to a political party. Power lies mm -hmm. in political parties, right? That is the route to power. You must hmm. belong to a political party. If you have, look, if they say you should go and see a Babalao, are you not going to be sitting down on the floor or the mat? Are you mm -hmm. not going to see amulets and uh, the horns of uh, a ram and so on? You are not going to be seeing uh, hamburger and uh, uh, yogurt at a Babalao's uh, set of uh, French fries, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You are likely to see amulets and all sorts of oh, ado and shells. Oh. Yes. So when you are saying you're talking about power, mm. power, the most powerful power is the one that comes through the ballot, through the popular mm. will, that is expressed in a secret ballot, right? And that involves millions of people. Well, even if they are not millions, but majority of those who have reached the age of voting, which is 18. Now, in diaspora, how many of us, you in your humble setup, how many people have voted for you in the position you are sitting in now? <laughs> Whether you are collecting salary or not, how many people have voted, even on your no, platform now? How many this people is, voted this is purely for, humanitarian. I'm not making money. How many people you know? voted for you to be in this Atlanta discussion? <laughs> How many votes did you receive? Oh, God. Oh, God. So without the power of the vote, mm. I did, let's be honest, even the American president, as powerful as he is, if he was not voted into power, would people be in awe of him the way they are? I don't think so. I don't think so. And you see that in the system that you have, Trump ran against Biden. Trump was mm -hmm. the incumbent, but Trump left, and he doesn't have even the seat of a counselor like Peter Obi and Atiku. So, but in South Africa, that's why we should start comparing systems as well, not just people mm -hmm. going on the ballot. Which system is best for a country like Nigeria? Is it the South African system where if you get 300,000 votes, you get seats in parliament, right? So even if mm -hmm. your party is small, if you contest on the national ballot, if you get 10% of the vote, you get almost 10% of the seats in parliament, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at in Nigeria, the ruling party, even though they did only 39% of the national mm -hmm. vote. 37, I tell you. <laughs> 37. In the National Assembly, they have a lot more seats, mm -hmm. isn't it? So it's it's so it's it's not it's it, it's um what do I call it? It's skewed against the other parties that did better, like Atiku mm. and Obi's votes. If it was in South Africa, they will control Parliament, isn't it? True, true. Isn't it that true. share of the national true. vote? Absolutely, so yeah, right. Fantastic. They will control yeah. Parliament. So mm. we have to start looking at the systems as well. We need to shake the tables and say, look, join a political party, but let's also look at the South African system. 
You see the president, the way he was elected in South Africa, he had to sit mm -hmm. in that place like everybody else. And his own peers had to elect him from that parliament. And he had to form a coalition before that election date so that he could get the majority of people to, to elect him as president. And having been elected by his peers, he, he now, the, his membership of parliament then falls away and he's not able to be sworn in as president. He's such a beautiful system that we can learn from. But of course, you, you will be able to find faults with it as well, I'm sure, as a political Absolutely. unit. Yeah, I mean, always I, advantage and disadvantage. Yeah, I've, I've, we've been discussing. I, I have a guy, you know, Adinji Wan, Jerry is one of my editorial guys, fantastic guy. You know, I'm sure, yeah, I'm trying to bring two of you together and myself so that we have a tripartite discussion on the system of democracy. So it's a good thing you've mentioned it, and maybe in, the, in less than a month we'll do that. Because I was going to ask you that, uh, what what system should we practice? Because Adinji Wan was like, in my private discussion with him, he said, look, you don't know what democracy suits us at all that. We're not democratic at all in any way. You know that, you know, the, the winner takes all, the chief marries four wives. You you don't speak to your father. I mean, that the Yoruba you know, city, for example, the daddy, whatever that he says is absolute or total. So I did not expect that it to be democratic. You, you go and start That's why the voices of yeah. daddies are in the <laughs> but, Oh, no, oh, no. So, I mean, we're, we're going to get to that. There's something I stumbled on today, you know, and I think it's worth sharing because I know you you are a PDP member, am I correct? Yes, I'm okay. fully a PDP so, member. Uh, are you still a member of PDP? Yes, I'm a full-time, lifetime member. Lifetime Not member. negotiable. Okay. We Not must say okay. where we are okay. comfortable. Okay, that's true. So what's happening in PDP? What's happening? Look, the well, opposition... I mean, you know, we had a National Executive Committee meeting recently. And we okay. said our national chairman should stay, I believe, for three to six months. I think we okay. have some tensions from the WK Atiku saga, the mm -hmm. G five. You know, we didn't, uh, we were not very lucky. A party mm -hmm. split into four or five pieces. You know, mm -hmm. we had the WK G five, then we had uh, the Kwankwaso factor, then we had P two B that took us out, uh, bombed us out the southeast. I don't think we even got any senator from PDP senator from the Southeast. Peter B was our biggest headache. But you know, because we're a big party and because we're a national party and we still did well in the gubernatorial and Senate and even House of Reps, I think we have over 100 uh, uh, members of House of Reps, over 30 senators. We even have two female senators, more than the APC and the Labour Party. With one each, we have King Gibe. Uh, sorry, not King Gibe. Labour has King Gibe. That's King Gibe. Uh, Apoti, Apoti Uduaga, and we have another lady from I think Rebus. So I think our party. Look, we are going through a lot of uh, pain because of the loss. You know, we've lost two elections or three elections back to back, from incumbency to the former vice president back to back. So I think it's a time for the party to start from scratch. Opposition is not a death sentence. I think we yeah. held power for 16 years. I think we'll yeah. make a very strong opposition, especially if we can uh, join with labor, because, you know, labor, we see labor as PDP, even though, you know, <laughs> they might not <laughs> like <laughs> to agree, but it's we okay. still see labor as... PDP, uh, sexy PDP, sexy part of PDP. Mm -hmm. So if we can join with Labour, I think we would defeat mm -hmm. APC in the next election. But I don't know who's okay. going to give way for who. But yeah, I think the uh, party so, is strong. We're still yeah, but, but Atiku, so, I mean, Atiku is an old guy. I, I asked Dele Momoza this question. And uh, so I'm going to ask you those same set of questions again. There are about three in one. So I'll ask you again. You know, I mean, I... I'm not, I don't hide it. At the last election, I supported Peter Obi. I, I, I still support him. My reasons are not far-fetched. And, and I think in a very corrupt Nigeria, an extremely corrupt Nigeria, a man came out and said, if there's anybody that has any, any ev ev evidence against my person of avarice, stealing, or pilfering public money, they should come out. I know the governor that took over from me, Willie Obiano, 
to, I mean, they fell out. I know Chuludo doesn't see eye to eye with him. So I feel that if there's anything, they will have come. And I think that's a lot of boldness. So for me, it's still the mouth of the job. But I haven't said that. Now, I asked Dele Momodu that, look, I was talking to people in Labour. I talked to the great Oselo Obazi. That's Oselo Kairi Obazi, fantastic guy. You know, erudite, that's good as, that's as good as it comes. Aki Oshitoku, you know, erudite. You know, it's also from our PDP. He has worked on the Obazi. These two are top notch. And empirically, they spoke and they said, Labour won the last election. I mean, the, the discussion for another day. Whether APC likes it or not, that topic will never go away, you know. So I asked the Labour model, okay, the guys in Labour are of that fervent belief that they won. As a matter of fact, it was PDP that told us that we'll be had over one million in Lagos State, as it's based on their own uh, uh, tabulation and all that. So if Labour are of that opinion, and they're backing it up to a very large extent that they won, so, in your opinion as a PDP man, do you think Article 1 or Article was second to be or what? That, that's the first question, yeah. Now, the second question is, 2020-27, it was clear that Obi was running me to Article in uh, 2019. And I think it was just sheer stupidity on, on the part of PDP leadership not to have managed Obi very, very well. Because there was no reason not to have repeated that thing, you understand, you know? That would be a good thing. I think we'll have defeated APC. You know, it was going to be a slam dunk. Now, going to 2007, do you think that article should still run? That's the second That's the second question. So let, let me leave it at that so that you have time to know. Mm -hmm. uh, Libor think they won. What do you think? Do you think PDP won or they came second? The second one is no, why should you, ask and I, not you, and I know that, you and I know that the elections, mm -hmm. they were not, uh, they didn't meet the standards that. Absolutely. Ought to have been met. I mean, look, they didn't know the mm. results of the presidential. The governorship was a different thing, and I was of assembly. For the presidential, there was a lot of irregularities. All the established bodies, the observers said that it was not, it didn't meet. I mean, mm. Nigerians cried. That was why the Supreme Court case, the PTOB and Atiku, they had a strong conviction that they were going to be able to dislodge or stop the president from continuing, you know, because they saw him in already. And the case was so we, uh, from where I'm sitting, I can't say who won, but I can okay. tell you that I can't, I can tell you that the president did not win, but I can't tell then what, because who won? I like Paulo, I like it. Not I like follow. And the reason why I was mm -hmm. saying the president did not win is because of the way this, the courts handle the matter. And the matter, yeah. all the evidence on technicalities mm -hmm. for exactly and they cleared the way for the president to emerge, even despite mm -hmm. more serious allegations against the president's his character, education, and all of that. But now, in terms of the uh, PDP, who runs, who doesn't run, and so on. Yeah. Yes, you know, Nigeria is a very funny place. It's very funny in the sense that. When you look at all the people that have been on the ballot for PDP since 1999, on the ballot, so we had President Obasan Joe, so and they had zoned the thing to the southwest, right? So mm -hmm. Falai Obasan Joe, Obasan Joe emerged when he was incumbent. He had the advantage mm -hmm. of incumbency. He got there and he imposed Yadadu and Jonathan on the party, and they he supported. Yaradua and Yaradua emerged. Atiku ran against Yaradua. Atiku ran against Yaradua and he lost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in 2011, Atiku went against Jonathan in the primaries and he lost. And Jonathan defeated Ribadu. And uh, who else ran against Jonathan? Le Buhari in 2011. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in 2011, Buhari was defeated by Jonathan. In 2007, Buhari was defeated by Yaradua. And in 2003, Buhari was defeated by Abbasanjo. So look at all the people that are running against each other. So in 2015, Buhari comes, but that's because PDP was, was, was you know, emery. Yeah, balkanized. <laughs> yeah, balkanized. And then Buhari was able to come in. And of course, now that he's incumbent, and who ran against Buhari was not even Jonathan. He was now Atiku. And Atiku is the same constituency as Buhari. So I didn't see yeah. how Atiku was going to beat Buhari. So now the chance that Atiku had to enter Asura 
was this time, but the results, you saw what happened, the manga manga business that happened. So in 2027, some people, the purists, or people who understand Nigerian politics will say, in terms of stature, in terms of even if you look at the Buhari factor that he ran three times before he got there, that everybody that becomes president of Nigeria, you have to pay your school fees. No, 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 I do that quite. Ghana, too, was a perennial. Yeah, president in South Africa, Africa. Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa Ramab was secretary general of ASC in 1990. Yes, I know. They, they, they signed up for Becky, yeah. And kicked him out into business. They kicked him out for Becky. Yeah. his way back. Uh -huh. He's uh -huh. his way back. He's fighting to hang in there because mm -hmm. they can remove him anytime, even with this new arrangement. It's not faith. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is mm -hmm. that if you look at it, let's take emotion out. Peter mm -hmm. is a new kid on the block. Yes, he's not young, but he's a new kid on the block. And also mm -hmm. the region of the country that he comes from, Christian, Igbo, he's not going to get as many votes as a Bola Tinubu, who's Muslim, Yoruba, Watiku is a northern Muslim. So when you start looking at the permeations, calculations, combinations, I think that Atiku still has an edge. However, however, like politics, anything is possible. So I think that there's nothing wrong with an Atiku will be ticket in 2027. Look at the new president of Liberia. He's 78 years old or 76 yes. years old. Look at Joe Biden. 82. Look at Zuma. Zuma at 82 is still taking 14% away from ANC. True, true. <laughs> Never mm. rule a Watara, Watara uh, Alassane Watara and uh, Ivory Coast. I know they love uh, them like yeah. that. Yeah. Look yeah. at Umnangagwa, 82. So what I'm saying is that Bubba. I won't rule Atiku out mm. and I won't rule him in. Or, you know, they also say when you're running for presidential in Nigeria, you must have deep mm. pockets. Very mm. deep. Very comfortable. <laughs> so if you don't have maybe ten million dollars more to play with, don't come out because <laughs> when you get to primaries, mm. you just let's people. let's even pray. Let's pray we make it to 2027 with our death profile <laughs> no, right now, No, we, we, we will go past you, but the but question will be, I mean, who I will be I left? Who will make it? Who mm, will be good left? Health. Mm. Who will I'm be left? In good health. Yeah, I'm talking good health. Who will be left? Oh, the okay. poverty level, you know. I mean, the last election we're talking about, the, the budget from the government was almost $300 billion, minus what came from the EU and the U.S., more than half of that money was supposed to be for technology. The and today, can't you know? take that money in one weekend. I'm telling you. Final question. Final question. And uh, I, I, I must ask you this, and uh, because you're PDP also, you know. In Malaysia, we all know Long Mahathir Mohamed was in power, you know, and uh, Asia, we've seen a lot of benevolent dictators. In Indonesia, we saw Suharto, Sukanu before him, Lee Kuan Yew in. Uh, uh, Singapore yeah. was there for a very, very long time. Kagame in Africa has been there. I mean, all these guys I mentioned are people that have done well, even as dictator, benevolent. Yeah, the dictatorship is always attached to it then, but they have done well. There's no doubt about it. Rwanda, yes, democracy, but the people seem to be happy with him, man. The, the ship of state is not ruderless in Rwanda. Uh, we all know what Mahati did and uh, Mati Mohamed did in Malaysia. And like I said, the example in Singapore. Now, back to Nigeria. I mean, people will say Obasanjo wanted a third time or all that, you know, Baba has denied it, you know, all that. But with benefit of hindsight, you know, with the way Nigeria has gone, the Nigerian trajectory from 2007 till date, do you think just maybe, just maybe, looking at the Baba's health today, I saw him the other day jump from, from the DS, from some platform down, you know, he's around everywhere. He was in South Africa too for Ramaphosa sharing and all that. So with benefit of Isaac, do you think it might just have been right to have possibly given up as a doctor? What do you think? Well, it should have been unconstitutional. And mm. um I mean know. the constitution will have been amended. It's not as if they're just gonna do it. You know, if the constitution was amended, do you think it would have been a wise, let me put it that way, if they were they were able to succeed in doing all that? Do you think it would have been wise? I think what Baba should have done, if I were mm. here, mm -hmm. I would have allowed uh, Nature take its course and allow my deputy mm -hmm. to succeed mm -hmm. me, as we've seen in South Africa, 
and mm -hmm. we saw that the time that there <laughs> there was a problem with deputy not succeeding, so mm -hmm. Mbeki didn't want his deputy to succeed him. There was a problem. The deputy succeeded him. Uh, Zuma didn't want Ramaphosa to succeed him. He supported his wife. The wife lost. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We see the problem uh, today. Uh, so yeah, even when before that, when Ubeki misbehaved, they kicked him out. They are not a grassroots man. They brought him Moglate to hold the seats pending when they did the election. That's true. Yeah, but yeah, but what I'm saying is that if uh, Baba had allowed Atiku, Atiku succeed him, <laughs> Atiku would probably have done eight years to 2015. Mm -hmm. There would have been no Jonathan or Yaradua, right? True. Because after Atiku. Somebody else would have turned up. It wouldn't have been right, Yaradua, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because Yaradua would have not nature would have taken its course. Yeah, there would have been no mm -hmm. Yaradua. So I don't think that we should worry so much about personnel. In fact, I posed a question to Baba many years ago that uh, Barack Obama said, "What Africa needs is strong institutions, not strong mm -hmm. men." And Baba True. disagreed with Barack Obama. I said Baba said I set up EFCC against all the odds from the Senate and so on. So I think that Baba was even lucky to get a second bite at the cherry because some of mm -hmm. his peers were killed on the job, Mutala Mohammed and so on. They were killed. You know, so many of them were slaughtered in that seat. So um, I think what we should be talking about now, even if Baba is still alive at 90, and there are examples of Kagame and Lee Kuan Yew, is that, look, after 64 years of independence, are we saying that we don't have leadership, that we can even take from private sector? I mean, Donald Trump came from big business, right? Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Sir Ramaphosa came from business, right? Mm -hmm. into, back into politics. So why can't we move a Dangote or a Lumelu to go and be a governor or a senator or start grooming people in business? Must they all come from local government chairman to minister to senator? <laughs> what are we saying the about Bahari leadership? Governor, yeah, what are we saying about leadership in Africa? If mm -hmm. you have not been a senator or a governor, you cannot be a minister. It's not. True. What about Akimumi Adeshino? What about Okonje? That's my man. That's a guy I would yeah. love to be president so today. So yeah. examples abound that you can even be a pilot, a wrestler. In America, you guys have produced bodybuilders who became governors. I know. They did a I'm good a job. Sorry? No, I, I said I know. I agree. People from very weird uh, professional background and they make it to the Congress. I agree with yeah. what you've said, and we are pressed for time as usual. With you, we can talk for a whole week. Fantastic <laughs> guy, Tujo Abatala, erudite scholar, a moving encyclopedia. You need to know, Tujo is knows everything, you know? And I have to say, I mean, people call me an encyclopedia, I know, but I mean, when I talk to Tujo, I listen, you know, so that's a lot. But then on a lighter note, let me tell you what I was trying to say later, something I stumbled on before we leave. So I, I read on some platform I belong to, they said State of the Nation. So I need this to make you happy because you're PDP said, state of nation. PDP produced three presidents, two of whom are university professors and the other an SOL general who is profoundly educated. That's good luck, Jonathan, most, uh, Umuru Yaradra, and Ulushe Kwabasoja. APC has produced two presidents and neither has any verifiable <laughs> academic record. They are also the president laced with tribalism. Mohamed Buhari, so yeah. that's that's our party yeah, shot. So today I'm happy, but I must blame you, labor guys. You are the ones that made a piece of power. So please, yeah, whenever I see a labor person, the labor of our people shall not be in vain. You have changed it. So, so you know, when I see a labor person or a PC person, uh, I I put them together. Labor made a PC stay in power. Simple, which I'll say. We shall say, Tuji, thank you. Thank you for always, you know, listening to us, leading our call. Fantastic. We, we appreciate well, you. Yeah. Well, we look forward to that tripartite discussion with me, you, and uh, Adejuwa and Jory. To the people in the seven continent, thank you for your loyalty. It's a wrap. We got to go. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.